Well, as Liz said, um, I was the AGU Congressional Fellow for 2009-2010. So first off, I would like to thank you all very much because you paid me for a year to spend a year, an amazing, totally astounding year working in Congress. And I appreciate the uh, privilege of having been able to do that very much. So as Liz said, if you want to go and talk to Congress, if you have some issue you want to get that you feel they should be paying attention to, it can seem very daunting. But my message to start is a repetition of some of what Liz just said, and that is you may not be alone. There is quite a bit of help out there. You don't have to do it all the heavy lifting yourself. You can take advantage of various support uh, systems. And AGU, in particular, have this... Um, Congressional uh, Policy and Congressional Visits Day coming up. This is, uh, will be very exciting. There's the day of training. There's two-day conference focused on earth and space science. And then the visits to congressional offices where you will be mentored through the whole process of how to hone your message. They will, help, they will set up the meetings for you on Congress with, your mem with members. You will be, your hand will be held through the whole thing. So it's a great warm-up for uh, getting engaged in the process. There are other congressional visits days. Uh, AGU is involved in Geosciences Congressional Visits Day, which is in September every year, going through the same thing without the policy conference. You have the training and then the visits. And the broader-based science, engineering, and technology congressional visits days, which are in April. The idea of all these is to present a concerted science is good kind of message to Congress at the same time. There are a few things that if you're going to do this, you need to be somewhat aware of, particularly if you're a federal employee. Uh, as you well know, the executive branch and the legislative branch are separate branches of government, and there's a, there are protocols for communications across that gap. And for agencies will have congressional affairs offices or something with a name like this, who basically manage and oversee communication between the two branches. And you should for sure make contact with them. Apart from anything else, they're a great resource. They have personal connections to people on the Hill. They will know the right people to talk to. They will know the most effective way to communicate your message. Agencies may inform but not lobby. So drawing that line is a bit difficult for an amateur. This is partly why congressional affairs offices are there and ethics offices. And if you're a federal employee, the Hatch Act uh, regulates what you can do for personal political activities. Again, check on it, ask first. The ethics office will be able to guide you in, if you are a federal employee. University employees, often many of the main universities have federal relations offices or something with a name like that, where again, they can help you enormously. It's not something that many faculty members uh, have a lot of dealings with sometimes, but they can be really useful. Go check with them. And corporate employees, there are lobbyists galore for every, the big companies and for all sorts of trade associations and trade organizations. And again, there are resources there that you can piggyback on. So what I would like to do, having said those sort of caveats, is tell you a bit about what it's like being the staffer. So that when you come to meet somebody from the Hill, be it a member or a staff person, that you will understand more about where they're coming from, and that should make it easier for you to communicate with them and to deliver a message in a way that resonates with them. So the first part I'm going to go through is what the staff mainly do, and then I'll take a break and transition into the protocols of meetings and the nuts and bolts of setting up meetings and how to do them. And I'd like to keep it very informal. Please. Ask questions at any point, um, wave your hand. If, if I don't see you, please interject. I, I'm here to be a resource for you, not to deliver a message that I feel I have to shovel out at you. So if you have any questions, please do interject, and it, I think it'll make it more valuable for us all. And if by any chance we don't quite make it to the very end, the handout which you got, which is the EOS article I wrote two years ago, I think now, uh, it covers quite a few of the practicalities of the meeting side, so don't feel 
that we have to you know, sacrifice anything too much, uh, ask the questions. So we're going to be talking about the legislative branch, which is the Senate and the House. Uh, the executive branch is the home of acronym SOUP, the executive office of the president with all the office of management and budget, OSTP, the office of science and technology policy, council on environmental quality, all these agencies that are, all these organizations that are trying to coordinate the federal agencies, which are even more list of acronyms. Then this judicial branch and then separately the legislative branch. And I'm not going to be talking about the others at all. So the House and the Senate, they are different beasts. They have different character, they have different rules, they have different ways of operating. But for this, the main thing you have to notice here is the two-year election cycle. That really is what drives almost everything that the people you will be meeting uh, are responding to. And it's not really a two-year election cycle. It's shorter than that. Congress is sworn in at the beginning of early January. The election is the beginning of November, a year later. So you've already lost two months from a re-election point of view. You're down to 22. Your constituents are making up their minds. They probably have already made up their mind by October. September, quite a few of them will. If you haven't done enough as a member in basically 20 months to get re-elected, it's too late. So you have 20 months start to finish to do enough, and you have to go fast. And the other thing is that a Congress lasts for two years. Any legislation that's introduced, if it is not passed into law by the end of those two years, it's dead. You start with a clean slate every two years as far as legislation goes. So you have the, 20, you have the 24 months to pass legislation, but you have 20 to 22 months for the electoral cycle. You do not have much time. Every time you meet somebody, it has to be productive, it has to be geared to an outcome, it has to lead to an action that will feed into this system because it may be too late. The time goes really quickly. That's why if you're used to a sort of academic time frame or a research time frame, it doesn't work. It's much quicker and, and much more, uh, you get the repercussions of what you've done much quicker in Congress. So there are two types of congressional offices, and it's important before you go to meet with them to understand which one you're talking to because they have different um, attributes. There are personal offices. Every member of Congress has their own personal office. So there are 535 of those. You have a fair shot of encountering one of them somewhere along the way. The committee offices, and I'll go into what the different offices are and what they do in a minute. There are 37 main committees between the House and the Senate. There are 45 in total if you count select committees, special committees, joint committees. So there are less committee offices, but if you want to advance your agenda, what you're really aiming for is getting at least one champion in the House and on the Senate side from a personal office. You need at least some one person in each side who will take ownership of your issue and will go to bat for it. You also want to secure the support of the committee staff relevant to your issue. And then after that, you want to round up as much support as you can from as many personal offices as you can. So that's what you're aiming for if you are trying to um, influence the outcome. So personal offices. I worked in the office of Senator Byron Dorgan from North Dakota. He retired. Uh, but they, I, it was a fascinating time to see what actually goes on in the offices. If you are meeting somebody from an office, the first filter they will put on any information you produce is, how does this relate to the member? All the staff, uh, personal offices, they are there to serve the member. That's the, your number one priority. It's, so they will say, how does, what does the member say, think about this? Is he or she interested in this issue? Do they have a position on it? Do they have a history on it? Does it re resonate with the member? The next thing you serve in the personal offices is your district or your state if you're a senator. In our case, North Dakota. So if you're looking for a champion, you need somebody 
whose constituents are interested in your issue. If tsunamis are your big thing, North Dakota is probably not your first port of call. It might be if, your mem if the member for some reason has some interest in it or is on a committee that is interested, but think strategically about where you invest your time. And then the other thing that sets the agenda for any personal office is, are the committee assignments of the member. Senate members are, usually have about four committee assignments. On the House, they have two. And committees are where policy really gets shaped and formed. This is where you're, in, you're at the table when it's being drafted and crafted. It's where you can actually have the most influence. So Senator Dorgan, he was on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, which does energy policy. He was the number two Democrat on that. He was on the Appropriations Committee, which controls money. Anyone on appropriations is an important person. And he chaired the Energy and Water Development Subcommittee, which, among other things, controls the funding for DOE's national labs. So he had a lot of... He had both the policy side of energy and the funding side of a lot of energy work. He was chair of Indian Affairs Committee, and he was on the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee, and chaired the Aviation Subcommittee there. So anything that came under the jurisdiction of those committees, he would be involved in, and his staff would be involved in all the way through. If it was, say, foreign affairs, not quite the office probably to come to as their first pass. And then it helps too to know who you are meeting. This, the Senate, um, senators get a lump sum depend, of money depending on the number, uh, the size of their district, how many people they're representing. And partly on seniority, you can accumulate things. But this would be a general organization of a Senate office. And the people, the Things in red are people you may encounter, you are most likely to encounter. So always at the top is the member. They, the office serves them. If I say it again, the office serves them. They are the important person. Then you have, in our case, general counsel, the senator's lawyer, who is also his floor manager, who keeps track of all the action on the Senate floor, when there are votes, when he can speak, what topics are being done, all the maneuvering that's done there. The chief of staff is the head of the office. The chief is, there's a very big dividing line between, um, between uh, campaign offices and legislative offices. The chief of staff is the only person who can go back and buy between them. We as legislative staff could have nothing to do with the campaign. The legislative director, who is known as the LD, they are in charge of all the policy within the office. They sort of make sure everything is running according uh, properly, that it's reflecting the member's wishes, that everybody's doing the work that expresses the opinion of the office. The people you're most likely to meet are the legislative assistants, the LAs. They will have a topic area each uh, in, in, on the Senate side. On the House side, they tend to cover a lot more subjects. But at this particular time, we had eight LAs. Um, there was banking, taxation, finance, all that, military, agriculture, energy, um, aviation and communications, all that stuff, and three who did nothing but North Dakota issues. The senator, we didn't need an, an Indian affairs person because as chair of the committee, uh, he had the entire committee staff working for him. And the same with appropriations. He had staff from the appropriations subcommittee working for him. So if you're meeting somebody, it's most likely going to be the LA. And then there are correspondents, fellows, the press office, the office manager. The other people you are likely to encounter are the schedulers. You want an appointment, you deal through them. <coughs> Senator Dorgan had two full-time schedulers. One did nothing but schedule his time every day for his DC meetings. Another, and it took them all their time to do this, to keep track of that. Another did nothing but his North Dakota and outside DC meetings. They're the gatekeepers. The IT manager, everybody will be, have Blackberries during your meetings, and they will be checking them, and you will think it's incredibly rude, and they're not paying any attention to you. And it isn't. It's, most of what comes through on the Blackberry, every time it buzzes, you have to check it, because you, what you're looking for is, does the member need anything? You can be in a meeting, 
and I've seen this happen, and the floor manager will send out an email saying, Byron's going to be speaking in 20 minutes on the floor about wind energy, he needs talking points. You've got 10 minutes because he has to then get to the floor. You have 10 minutes to get the talking points, get them to him, and out. So you interrupt the meeting for that. Most of the time, you will check your BlackBerry and say, it's irrelevant. So if you're in a meeting, don't get upset if everybody's looking at their Blackberries. That's what they're mo monitoring because, as I've said before, their primary task is serving the member. And that's what they'll be doing. State meetings in state, the state director, we had three state offices in North Dakota. It will entirely depend on the member and the size of the state, how many offices they had. It's often easier to meet them in the district than to come to DC. In the house side, because their districts are smaller and they're all meant to be about the same size, they're way more intense, they're way more frenetic, they're dealing with everything, and they're only allowed a maximum of 18 permanent staff, including their staff back in the district. So people are dealing with far more things, it's far more buzz, buzz, buzz. The Senate tends to be a bit calmer and more specialized. And this is what a day in a personal office feels like, except that this isn't quite chaotic enough for some days. You have, uh, let's see, I can work this thing. And find my arrow. This one up here, this could be you up here. Oh, I'll do it again. Um, meeting with constituents, then we have hearings. Every, for every hearing, the staff prepares a briefing book for the member. It'll be about this thick, all the testimony. If you're called to be an expert witness, you have to submit your testimony two days ahead of time, and it will go into a briefing book. The staff will have given an uh, uh, opening speak statement for the member. They will give all the background information. They will have a list of questions for every, per every uh, witness. There are floor speeches, there are television interviews. You're meeting with constituents, there are speeches after speeches after speeches, so the staff are all writing those. In our case, we just wrote talking points and Byron would always talk extemporaneously. Uh, others, they will sit there and they will read exactly what the staff have given them. More meetings, more meetings. It's a real people place, it's face to face. And then somewhere in the background, in the midst of all this, you have to write legislation. So committee offices are a bit different. Um, this is the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. Committees, you will have a majority and a minority staff. The majority staff is always bigger. They control the money. They're not, the staff and the offices are not tied to a district, so they can take a more national viewpoint. They stand back. They're not, they, they do serve the, the chair and the ranking member. So say now in, in Energy and Natural Resources, Senator Bingaman's from New Mexico, Senator Murkowski's from Alaska, those states will, they will get special attention. But in general, committees look at the national picture and they are the hub of the policy process. This is where legislation gets drafted. It's where the, uh, they decide what to have hearings on, they decide what, what is going to be brought to attention. And the staff will know a lot about their issues. Instead of, they, they will have very specific, there will be somebody for resources policy, there will be somebody for wind and renewables, there will be somebody for national parks, there will be somebody for all these things. So they know their subject area much better than the uh, personal office people. They organize hearings, they have oversight of agencies, they're the people who delve in and say, we told USGS to go do this, did they do it? They can call in people from agencies and say, excuse me, what are you doing about this, that and the other? We want to report. And they, they're a lot of the corporate memory of how, what works and, what, and why it works for legislation. Okay, so meetings, yes, I'm lagging behind. We'll have to gallop through this. It's a very, it's a very personal place. Personal meetings are way more effective than sending information. Sending six attachments, forget it. Mail, old, old style mail goes through so much security that really email is the way to go if you have to do it from a distance. You can ring people up and ask to talk to them. You can ask to be put through to the LA that deals with your issue. But it's very much a uh, personal relations, building trust, building linkages. And that takes time, often. So if you're meeting with a member, 
They are very busy people. Senator Dorgan's day was scheduled in 15 minute increments. Uh, the 15 minutes that you're allotted would include maybe him walking from the Senate floor over to the meeting room, all the introductions, maybe a photograph if that's required, and then, you've got, then you have to say what you want. They may or may not know much about your issue, but treat them with utmost respect. These people, well, A, they're important, and B, they think they're important. <laughs> so make them feel important. And whenever you're meeting a member, it's going to be retail politics. You know, they're out there campaigning. They're, you want something from them, they want something from you. This is the nature of the game. And their key question is, why do I need to know this information? You have to make it clear to them why they need to know whatever it is you're telling them. And if you're meeting with staff, they too are very busy and they have multiple responsibilities. You're only part of their day. They also want to know why they need to know it, but they also want to know, so what, who cares, why bother? What's the broader context? What's, what's the payback for this? Who's for it? Who's against it? Where are the awful potholes that I have to prevent the member from walking into that attached to this issue? They need more than just why do I need, they need to know why do I need to know it, but they also need to know a lot more about why is this important? Who is it going to get support from? How is it going to advance whose agenda? All that kind of thing. So, before you go, refine your message. You have to be able to make your point in five minutes. If the senator comes for his 15 minute meeting and you, have, you will be lucky if you get five minutes of substantive time out of that. Be able to deliver it in two to three minutes. And this is actually a pretty good book, Escape from the Ivory Tower, to tell you how to hone your message. This is the key. We've, we've made it to this slide. This is the one that I want to get to. This sums the whole thing up. Any meeting, what is your ask? What do you want somebody to do? What action are you seeking? Because Congress, you have to do something. It's not just, oh, well, it's a nice day and it's so many miles to the moon and it's so many miles to the stars and isn't it neat? It's, so what? They're about action. They have to do things. They have to you know, be seen to be doing things. And you need to make it really clear in two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, what you want. And, you know, have a picture of your bone <laughs> in your bowl. But that really is what will get your message across if you can get to that point. That, that's what they want to know. So when you come to organize your visit, yes, you should start with your own member in your own district. You have by far the best chance of getting into those offices. But you want somebody who has an interest in your issue. And you also want to have somebody who has influence on your issue because it's wasting your time if you're talking to somebody who can't do anything about it if you're trying to get the ball rolling. If you're trying to drum up broad support for something across the entire Congress, then talk to everybody. If you're trying to get something really moving from an early stage, you want somebody who actually can do something about it and deliver the goods. You want to express your opinion early. It's no good. By the time something comes to a floor vote, it is, there is so much time and so much effort and so many compromises built into it that it's, in most cases, too late. There, you can change things till the last minute, and things do get changed at the last minute, but you are, you'd be far more effective to get in early in the process. If you want to meet members, oftentimes meeting them at weekends when they go back to their districts is more effective. It's easier for you. It's easier for them. They won't have their LA, their subject matter expert with them, but you may get in to meet them and at least get started on it. If you're coming to DC and you want to meet with staff people, Mondays and Fridays are often better because depending on how Congress is working or not working, it hasn't been exactly you know, oiling the wheels very well the last while, but in general, they try and take long weekends because members have to go back to their districts. They leave on a Friday, fly back. Byron would have meetings nonstop all day Saturday, all day Sunday, fly back Sunday night or Monday in order to vote. So they, if, they're, if 
they often arrange it so there are no floor votes on a Friday or a Monday so people can leave and go back to their districts. That means that the staff aren't as tied up serving the member because they're in the district so they may have more time to meet with you. It doesn't always work but it's just one of those tips that often does work. And you've got people like AGU and all the other societies that can help you set up these meetings. So the first thing to do is you have to make an appointment. And if you're meet, meeting the member, you contact the scheduler. If you're meeting the a legislative assistant, you can contact them directly. You can phone the office main number and say, hey, who's the LA for this issue? Can you give me their phone number or their email? Usually you'll only get the front desk phone number and you won't get their personal one, but then they will patch you through if the LA is available. And once you have the meeting set up, you submit a memo with a list of everybody that's going to be there, their affiliations, and what your main talk, your points are. Because before every meeting, before you come in to meet a member, the staff will have drawn up a briefing memo for the member, and it will have all this information on it. It will say who's coming, where they're from, what they want to discuss, what the member's previous positions were on it, what the pros and cons of the issue are, any warnings of saying, you know, don't say this or do say that or ask about this, ask about that. So the more information you can give the staff ahead of time, the more productive the meeting is because they know where you're coming from and you can get to the meet more quickly. Do your homework. Don't waste your time and their time by going to somebody who really couldn't care less, won't ever do anything, or is completely entrenched on one side of the debate that isn't yours. Uh, you, won't, you can try turning them around, but chances are you're better off to concentrate on people that you actually can influence. Uh, know what agencies are involved. Know what the funding levels are if you want more funding for a project in science. Know what agency it's in, know what committee has jurisdiction over it, know how much money they did get, know what you're asking for, what is your ask, and why, and all the background information, because that's what they will ask you. And be aware of the pros and cons of whatever you're suggesting. A small group is better, two, three, maximum four, because rooms are very small. You have a chance of getting into a meeting room and actually sitting down with somebody, and you also waste less time on introductions. Have a leader who can introduce everybody and have a brief summary to leave behind. One or two pages, no more. It'll go in the bin. The usual, be on time. They are very... You miss your slot, you've lost your slot. You turn up 15 minutes late, they're already on to the next person. But be prepared to wait. So build in lots of slop time. Don't have your meetings scheduled back to back to back because you may not make there. If there's a floor vote, that takes precedence. If the member wants something, that takes precedence. You are important, but there are other things that are more time sensitive. And you have to just say, okay, this is DC. I know my place. This is how it works. If the member has to vote, that's how it goes if they're in a hearing and it takes longer to get to their questions. Pack your patience, as they say. But you, you have to be on time, even if they are not. Dress appropriately, that's more out of respect for the system. And no, don't count on any audio, audio visuals. It takes forever to set them up, they don't have them, and you don't have time to deliver them all anyway. And have business cards to leave behind. Every meeting in DC, business cards, first pass, then you get on to the business in hand. And again, the usual messages, be positive, be polite. Be succinct, be focused on policy. They want to know what do you want us to do. It's not, okay, here's all the science. Don't spend all of your, four of your five minutes explaining the science. They want to know, so what? So this is the science, now what do I do about it? What do you want Congress to do that you guys can't do on your own? And yeah, don't over it, I mean, the usual. Be sensible. Uh, they will detect, um, fraud and overselling and all that very quickly. And if you lose credibility, that's it, you're gone. You want to build up your credibility, it may take multiple visits, but that's trustworthy. Trust is the currency of the realm there. And again, know what you want to ask for and what action you're seeking. Afterwards, email a thank you. And then if they ask for information, provide it quickly. 
beat the iron while it's hot. Some new thing will be flavor of the month two hours after you've left the office. So follow up, keep going, keep the pressure on. And remember that you're only one of a gazillion voices clamoring for Congress's attention. You have to, you don't, one visit may do a lot, but it may take multiple visits. What really works is multiple messages, the same messages coming from multiple trusted sources. And which is why things like Congressional Visits Day works and the whole orchestrating a message type of thing does work. Trusted sources are very important and if it comes from a whole bunch of different places, that's really good. And science, obviously, we wouldn't be doing it if we didn't think it was important, but it's very important for decision making. Part of the clamor is to get your side heard. Ideally, front page of the New York Times, that will set the committee agenda. Front page of the Washington Post is pretty high. Um, the news aggregators, Energy and Environment, Daily, e and &E, PM, Green Wire, they, they take all the stories that they think are relevant to policy on, in the energy and environment field, and there are similar ones for all the other specialties, and they do sort of reader's digest summaries that come out every day and get to the email boxes of all the staffers on the Hill. You want your news on that. That will get it in, that will reinforce it, that will get it into their inbox and on their radar screen. But your job is to try and promote whatever it is you want promoted. Do it as effectively as you can. Use all the resources you can. AGU, I'm offering Liz up for <laughs> all sorts of things, but they are a tremendous resource. They can help you through any of this, and they will know who, who you should speak to, and often will help setting up meetings and things like that too. So that, there are a few other, there are other resources, as well as AGU, AGI have a, uh, also have a news blog, uh, not a news blog, a newsletter, a news bulletin that comes out on everything relevant to policy, all sorts of other ones. Um, so that's my quick tour through communicating with Congress, and if you have any questions, I will do my best to help you, but go do it. It's amazing. I have found you walk up and you knock on the door and it opens. It really does. A lot of it's just having the confidence and finding a door, any door almost. And once you've done it once, it gets easier and easier. And you get more effective at it too. Thank you all for being here. Please join me in thanking Dave. All right, thank you.